Shalom, Light of the Infinite Festival. My name is Benji Epstein, and I'm coming to you from my daughter's bedroom in your Kodesh. It's bedtime in the Epstein house, and if you want to see the Light of the Infinite come down to its lowest places, uh, you should come to my house for bedtime. Um, but I'm so honored and blessed to be here, even though I'm currently afflicted with the uh, strep, the deleket. Um, I'm my my throat might be a little bit sore, and my head might be a little pounding, but my heart is bursting with tremendous gratitude for everyone here, uh, specifically Riberez, uh, who is my newest best friend. So I just want to thank you so much for this opportunity. And uh, let's just jump into it. I'm a clinical psychologist in Jerusalem. I wrote a fantastic book called Living in the Presence. Uh, Connie is a fan, uh, a Jewish mindfulness guide to everyday life. Got to gotta push product a little bit. And again, tremendous gratitude to the Almighty and to all the people here. Uh, sitting here on Rosh Chodesh Sivan, on Tiferes of Malchus, and just trying to envision what this whole uh, Lollapalooza of spirituality uh, could look like, and feeling tremendously, tremendously grateful. I'm actually just going to check and make sure that we're, 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 we're uh, going on now. I'm going to tell Aris that I'm on. I'm on, baby. I'm on. I'm on. I'm on. I'm on. Okay. So I want to start with the Bnei Yisachar, an idea from... Uh, his Sefer, Igrid the Kala, where he talks about how at the end of our time, when our neshamos are not at their most exalted level compared to previous generations, and he says, we have to help each other out. He says, we can't do it alone anymore. He says, each one of us doesn't have the strength to complete the task that we've been charged with to complete. And he says, certainly when it comes to the exalted task, the Melechus HaKodesh, of helping out other fellow Jews, and he says we must be vigilant. He says we must work extremely hard at this time that there should be great love between those who are, and he uses this phrase, chaverim makshivim, loosely translated as friends who, who listen, friends who are in tune with one another, who are trying to hear, who are trying to understand. And I feel very confidently that this group, this unbelievable assemblage of people is specifically who the Igrid de Kala is referring to. As Rabano says, we're one, but we're not the same, right? We get to carry each other. We're one. So what is Am Yisrael? Am Yisrael, the Jewish people, is an infinite subject because the subject matter is itself infinite. Am HaNetzach. And we're just going to shift to a story of what it means to love another Jew. And this is my favorite. Nah, I say they're all my favorite, but this one happens to be top five top three maybe, of learning how to love another Jew from Moshe Leif Sasover. And if you haven't heard this one yet, then worth the price of admission. His love for his fellow man was all-encompassing of Moshe Leib. It was something that he had from a very, very young age, ready to, ready to sacrifice everything for the other. It was all-encompassing. And he would often share with his Hasidim, with his students, that the most potent lesson or the most clear way that he learned about how to love another, how to love his fellow man, was ironically from two Russian peasants. He happened to walk into an inn. I don't know if you know that Hasidic rabbis would go to an inn and hang out. And there were two thoroughly drunk Russian peasants there, probably drinking the last drops of a bottle of Ukrainian vodka, which probably wouldn't be happening now. And one of them turns to the other and he says, you know, after they have a few l'chaims together, one of them turns to his friend and says, Igor, do you love me? And Igor is taken aback. Where'd that come from? Uh, of course, Ivan. Of course I love you. You're my comrade. You're my brother. Back to their drinking. A few more uh, l'chaims, a few more saludes. And again, Ivan turns to his friend I Igor and says, But do you really love me? Do you truly love me? And now Igor is feeling a little bit cornered. You know, where's this coming from? It's a little bit, uh, it feels a little bit attacked. And he says, well, what do you think? I don't love you. Of course I love you. We're best friends. We're comrades. We grew up together. We served in the army together. Salud. We're best friends. L'chaim, I love you. And finally, after a few more drinks, you can see Ivan is so, so distraught and so worked up. He finally turns to his friend Igor and says, yeah, really? You say you love me? If you really loved me, then why don't you know what hurts me? Why don't you know the pain that I feel in my heart right now? So what's our job? Our job is to get to the inside, an inside job. Our job is to learn more and more what about 
our own inside is, what our own insides are about. This is loving ourselves and loving our fellow Jewish brother from the inside out. This is the inside out approach. And what this means is that we can learn how understanding our own and others' inner workings will then ultimately help us understand their outer behaviors, the outer behaviors of ourselves and of others. Right? To feel the pain of another, to feel the pain of another Jew, to know what hurts me and the pain that I have in my heart would mean that you know your own pain in order to feel what is hurting and what is missing. And that's when you truly love somebody. And of course, kamocha, love your fellow man kamocha, like you love yourself. And so we have to start with self-love, the self-compassion. You know, shouldn't be too hard, right? And then I ask myself this question, and again, I'm just speaking to myself, and I'm happy that everybody's eavesdropping in the voice in my head. How many of us, how easy would it be for me to feel compassion towards the person sitting across from us in the screen, sitting next to us, right, than ourselves? And in the interest of time, we're just going to sort of skim this, the, 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 the sources. And if you want to reach out to me afterwards and discuss this further, please please do. This is my, this is my Facebook page and now I'm on Twitter and I'm on Instagram and, and I answer as whoever reaches out. Um, so, so happy to connect. But Rabbi Nachman is magnum opus in the Kutim Aran in Torah Samach Dalad, which is not that I have any expertise, but probably one of the more uh, difficult pieces in what proves to be an extremely difficult, but uh, mesmerizing and life-changing sefer. In Samach Dalad, Rabbi Nachman starts where he starts with why Hashem created the world. Why did God create the world? And you know, there's so many different answers. And he's the first person I ever saw where he says he says it's out of Rachmanus. He says it was out of compassion. He, Kaviyachol, wanted to reveal this mita of Rachmanus. And if he hadn't created the world, then who would he show his Rachmanus to? Who would he have compassion on or for? And so therefore this entire Bria, every single point of creation, is in order to reveal and demonstrate this Mida of Rachamim. And Mahu Af'ata, Imitashi Odei. We need to be like, we need to mimic, we need to mirror the divine as above, so below. And so Mahu Af'ata, the purpose of one's entire existence, our entire existence, is to cultivate this mida of Rahmanas. The whole creation is to reveal this compassion. It's the tachlis. It is the singular point of our entire avoda. And yet, there is often one person in our lives that no matter how hard we try, this one person, because of what he or she did or does, makes it so you simply can't forgive. You cannot relate to them with this Rahmanas. You cannot feel Rahmanas towards them. And because of that, because your heart doesn't let you have Rahmanas on this person, right? the heart will ultimately remain shut to others as well. And of course we know that the person that I'm referring to is the person ourselves, to, to myself, to yourself. And Rabbi Nachman's svarim are replete with, with him talking about how he had Rahmanas on his own self. Specifically in Shifrei Haran, he refers to it in a few times that he had Rahmanas on himself. So what does that even mean? What does it mean that I, I have to have Rahmanus on myself in order to love, in order to care for, in order to really be present for the other, in order to be a chaveri makshivim? So what I've seen in my own professional life and what I see becoming more and more predominant these days is we have a tendency to get into some kind of punishing relationships with our minds in which we practice intense criticism, self-deprecation, we feel like doing these things will be a viable path to improving our lives, to bettering ourselves. And we become disgusted, ashamed by our fears. We're frightened by our desires. We don't acknowledge our anxiety. And we struggle tremendously with our labile, tumultuous emotions. And if we take the wrong step, if we're not perfect, we feel disgraced. When we fail to impress, when we don't get enough likes, we ascribe that to something unlikable, irredeemable within us. And when we experience pain or sorrow, there's something wrong, and then it becomes that there's something wrong with me. 
And so we anguish over our disappointed expectations, and what we do is we retaliate against our own minds by hating this lack of control, and that just turns into hating ourselves, to self-loathing. And there are so many occasions for disbelief in our inherent worth, especially if we're drawing from outside sources to validate that worth, right? If something goes wrong, when something goes wrong, and something will inevitably go wrong, when all I feel is removed from who I am in my essence, when I feel removed from the presence of God, how am I supposed to, be, how am I supposed to believe in that love? How am I supposed to believe in my inherent worth? Yisrael asher b'cha es po'er. We're about to celebrate the Chag of Shavuot, where essentially Hashem says, I choose you. Imagine the bride going under the canopy and saying, as they're about to get married, I just want you to know that I sometimes bite my nails. I love you, babe. I love you. What are you talking about? We're about to get married. I, I, sometimes, I sometimes don't put the toilet seat down. Yisrael asher b'chaz player. And we get stuck. You want me to imagine that I'm still very close to you and that what I do matters and is meaningful? You want me to believe that you love me and that my life makes a difference, that my actions make a difference? How is it that I could ever love myself? How is it that you could ever love me? And these are moments if we're open enough and willing to go inside and think about it a little bit more and do that self soul searching. These moments can provide and provoke terrifying and depressing internal responses, right? This closeness, this meaning, this empathy that are our lives' objectives are meant for everyone, everyone but myself. This grace exists but remains unavailable to me. The Gemara speaks on a few occasions, the Talmud speaks on a few occasions of the great scholar, Elisha ben Abuya, who became... Uh, he became an apicorus, he became an, ap an apostate later in his life, and he subsequently became known as Acher, the other one, the other one, when we other ourselves, when we other someone else, right? He's not Stam called Acher. But his ever-devoted student, Rebbe Meir, would often beg him, please, Rebbe, consider, reconsider your decision. And he would show his teacher proof after proof after proof, saying that it's never too late for repentance. A person can always do tshuva. Then every single time his former master would end the discussion by responding, I heard a heavenly voice. And this heavenly voice, quoting or paraphrasing the verse in Jeremiah that said, Shuvu banim shovavim, return all my mischievous children. And the voice in Rabbi Lisha ben Abuya's head said, all of my children can return, chutz, except all but me, all but acher. This Tzadik, this Gaon, this towering rabbinic figure, could do nothing to overcome the self-doubt. His guilt was so great in his mind that it could not fathom that his own iniquities could also be encompassed by God's love, by God's forgiveness. Everyone. He believed that everyone could return, no matter how grievous the transgression, except for him. And ultimately, we end up defeating ourselves. Because, don't we hear that voice also? Don't we feel the exact same way? Maybe it's just me, I can't see if you're nodding your head. When you do something really wrong, when you've done something really wrong, don't you hear that exact same voice? The whole world can return. Love, light, infinite. The light of the infinite. It's for everyone except every Jew can affect all of universes. Tshuva goes all the way up to the throne of glory except for yours. That's the unforgivable sin. That voice inside oneself is the exact same one that Revelisha ben Abuya heard. That only he, that only I am ineligible to return, that I can never come back after my misdeed. So why is compassion for ourselves so difficult? And we know that compassion comes out of a willingness to come close, to become really intimate with suffering. So even though we want to be compassionate, it's not always easy to be opening 
to open ourselves up to the suffering that's there. We don't want to acknowledge. We're afraid of pain. We're conditioned to run, to fight or flight it. Right? We don't want to acknowledge and be open to this pain because it's, it's really hard to be open to these mind states. And just like it's difficult for our own pain, we often don't particularly want to be open to the pain and suffering of others. And if for whatever reason we can't find that Nikuda Tova, that point of good within ourselves, then we won't be able to see the Nikuda Tova in others. And again, remember that we're working from the inside out. We have to start. It begins at home. It has to start with the Kamocha, Kamocha Mamish. And Rabbi Nachman in Tinyana, in Lukut Amran Tinyana Zion, talks about how one can become a Jewish leader. And everyone sitting here is a Jewish leader. It's not just for the Moshe Rabbeinu, it's meant to be the people who want to be better friends, better partners, better parents. And Rabbi Nachman shares the secret to becoming, to being a leader of the Jewish people through the Iker Mida of the Jewish leader, which is the compassion. And he writes in Torah Zion, he talks about the Iker Rachmanus, the greatest Rachmanus, the greatest empathy we have to have is when a Jew falls into sin, when a Jew is no longer living in line with his values and falls into the delusions of who he is or what he really is. Because that's the greatest Rachmanus there is to see through the veil, to see through the delusions, to see who you really are. Because again, the greatest type of suffering that exists in the world cannot equal the heavy burden that we carry walking around knowing our flaws, knowing our faults. Because when we fall into the world of Averos, when we fall into the world of Chata'im, of missing the mark, it weighs heavily upon us. And we suddenly feel like life becomes unbearable. As like the says in the Pasuk, Gadol Avonim in So, as, as Kain says, right? Is it getting heavy? Well, I thought it was already as heavy as can be. Just making sure anybody stuck around for a Flaming Lips reference. <laughs> so Rabbi Nachman is teaching us that a leader and all of us, all of us need to emulate this trait a leader of our generation, specifically now, as we're getting closer and closer to the final generation. A leader of our generation has to be a person who knows their own intrinsic holiness, who knows the holiness of others, where it comes from, to understand the delicate and sensitive nature of a Jew, and that by nature a Jew is foreign to sin. He's teaching us, Rabbeinu is teaching us, that although our personal experience may tell us otherwise, self-compassion, Love yourself is the most natural thing in the world. Self-compassion, loving yourself, is the most natural thing in the world. Rabbeinu. Self-compassion is going to create that caring space within you that will ultimately be free of judgment. It's going to provide for you that space that sees your hurt and sees your failures, and softens, and creates that holding space to allow all of those experiences, to relate to all of these experiences with kindness and with caring. Iker harachmanus, Rabbi Nachman writes, Hu kishi Yisrael am kadosh nofli. When you fall, that's when you need to trigger that. That's when you need to tap into that. When I begin to think about this and understand that I, I myself, and you, if you're here with me, the biggest Rachmanus, despite all that I have done, despite all that you may have done, and all of my shortcomings, all of your shortcomings, all of our shortcomings, you still love me. I am loved. I am beloved. I am still worthy of love and I look at the Rachmanus of my life or better yet I look at my life with Rachmanus who am I really I am a chelek eloka nimal I am a chip of the divine block I am a piece of infinite light 
I am this festival. So regardless of how old we are, what stage of life we find ourselves in, we're all in the same boat. Uh, during Corona, I corrected myself, we're all in the same boat. <laughs> we're not always in the same boat, we're in the same storm. But here we're in the same boat. Because when we feel as if we can't bring out and express in our thoughts, in our words, in our actions, this great truth that is burning inside each and every one of us, and we get stuck in superficiality, and then we're unable to feel an intimate connection with the deeper part of who I truly am, let alone with the others, there's no way. And then it's dafka because we want to love and care for ourselves, that we don't desire and we don't crave a life that's glutted by possessions and, and, and internet uh, stimulation and stuff. And we just amass mindlessly and scroll without any sort of any purpose. Be compelled because we don't know what else to do. Compelled because what do we do when we wake up in the morning? We want to feel alive. But when we start to learn to love and care for ourselves, that we start to move away from deifying any voice, from buying into the voice of the serpent, any voice within that mocks us, any voice that humiliates us, any voice that will mercilessly put us down no matter what, internal or external. And we both know, the royal we, both know that the internal voice is so much more painful. And of course that voice in your head will tell you that self-compassion is a private cocoon that's going to close you off from other people. It'll make you more selfish. It'll make you more egotistical. It'll make you more self-centered. And of course, of course, that's the ego protecting itself. The reverse is of, of course that's the case. The more open-hearted we are with ourselves, the closer we're going to feel towards the rest of our life. Self-compassion is going to be, it's going to serve as the foundation for kindness towards others. When we're accepting of our own flaws, of our own idiosyncrasies, that means we're going to keep doing them. It's like, ah, ah, I see myself clearly and I see where that's coming from. I see the kinataiva kavod that might have motivated that, that unskillful action. I can accept that, commit to not doing it again, right? And become more accepting of others. To just have rahmanus on myself, meaning on that deeper self that hasn't yet become the name that is attached to Shavuos and the name Aleph Hey Yud Hey is I am becoming that has yet to become that is waiting to become that hasn't been fully experienced is in its own Golis and that's the Golis Hashchina that's within ourselves the exile exile <laughs> exile of the divine presence is when we're living estranged from that spark and so when we're finally able to let go of our egos and see the Rachmanus of our entire lives, then our hearts can open up. And then we can really have Rachmanus on others and all of their mistakes and shortcomings. And we can see them for who they really are. We're never acknowledging the pain and difficulties in some sort of masochistic way. We're not trying to get depressed. We're not trying to beat ourselves up and prove how lowly we are. Right? We want to see the truth of our experience, not some superficial truth of some passing circumstance. But what's really true? What's our deepest intention? Right? Pausing. What do I really want? What's really true right now? And then when we look into the heart of this pain, we can really connect with others. We can get right to the heart that matters. We get right to the heart of matters, right? Because it's the heart that matters more. And if we know, Rabbi Nachman continues, if we know Kedushas, and he talks about how if you really understand who you are, if you really, really, really get intimate with who you truly are and who the other really is, then you see there is no, no connection to this unskillful action. This is, this is, this is not, this is not me. This is not who you really are. That's not who you really are. And this is the responsibility of our generation to understand our own nature of Kedusha Sisrael, our own Kedusha. We just read, I think we're going to be, uh, we're going to have to cut it down. Um, uh, we just read about how uh, in the Tochacha, that one of the curses that we read about is that your, your life is going to be hanging. <laughs> right? you're going to be, you're going, your life is going to be hanging in the balance and you're going to be a fearful day and night. You're not going to believe in your life. 
right again which is on a basic level you're going to be running for your life you're going to be scared you're 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 going to be in this you know purgatory state of life and death you don't know when it could end that fear you know the death anxiety is going to be really palpable and you're not going to believe in your own life and this refers to the physical threat of survival but what the svarim akadoshim teach us is that you won't believe in your own life the greatest curse that a person can experience is the disbelief please don't continue to believe in your disbelief we believe in our disbelief the disbelief in our own lives, that even at times of physical peace and prosperity, and I don't think we've ever had it this good, we've lost faith in our own lives and the meaninglessness. We've become focused on the meaninglessness and, and we've forgotten the meaningfulness, the meaningful minutes, the holiness, the importance of our own lives, which leads ultimately to shame, which followed, of course, shame follows, you know, right afterwards, that contempt, that hate for one another, that inability to forgive oneself. And if you're a person who hates yourself, can you really, really love anyone else? Can you love your higher power? You're probably, your laundry list is pretty long. And if we look at ourselves and each other like this, if we neglect to deepen our perspective of who we truly are, of, of, of Rabbi Nachman says, Me'ayin him l'kuchin, where B'nai Yisrael is taken from, where your soul root is derived from. And if we continue to see ourselves in a superficial way, and we can't believe that tshuva coming to who we really are, coming back to our truest nature, if we can't believe in it. And Rav Kook, in his Oros HaTshuva, in chapter 14, writes that the Iker HaNasphilos, the main, the main difficulty that comes in our own lives because we ain't no mom in Bekalusa HaTshuva. We don't believe in it. We don't believe that we can return to essence just like that. The same way I know that deep down the reason I act a certain way isn't because I'm evil, isn't because I'm wicked. Right? That's what we do in therapy. We get really clear. I'm not a therapist who's going to bring something out from the outside and help you see that. It's just like, what's really true? Because the way you're seeing it isn't how I'm seeing it. You're not a bad person. You're not evil. You're not wicked. You might be lonely. You might be confused. You might be nervous about so many things, but you are not a Russia. You are not fundamentally flawed. And once you start to see that, your heart could open up. And you could really start to see your shortcomings clearly in spite of your failures, in spite of your disappointments. And then the heart opens and softens and you can see the other person. And once we become in touch with what's going on inside us, we can feel so much closer to others because that same potential, seen or unseen, actualized or wasted, exists within all beings. May all beings be happy. And we can recognize that because I see it in myself and I'm just a light reflecting onto you and you're just a light reflecting onto me. And so when we see, when we can see that our lives can transform in an instant to something unrecognizable from what we anticipated when we woke up this morning and began the day, and, and that it's true for all of us, all of the time, moment by moment by moment by moment, this recognition lifts us up and leads us to compassion and its unique happiness, which is connection. And uh, there's a second part here where we're going to learn the second piece of, uh, a piece of the Kuti Maran. Torah Reish Peibet Azamra, um, but uh, we don't have time for that right now. But I'm going to read a poem uh, that just you know I'm reminded by it, and if it's okay, hopefully Erez doesn't mind. Uh, it's called um, Awakening Now. It's from a poet named uh, Dana Folds, and with that I wish you all a beautiful, beautiful Chag Matan Torah Tenu. Thank you so much, a Chodesh Tov. Love every single one of you. Feel so blessed to be connected to this 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 Chaveri Makshivim. The moment your eyes are open, seize the day. Would you hold back when your beloved beckons? Would you deliver your litany of sins like a child's collection of seashells, prized and labeled? No, I can't step across the threshold, you say, eyes downcast. I'm not worthy. I'm afraid. And my motives aren't pure. I'm not perfect, and surely I haven't practiced nearly enough. My meditation isn't deep. My prayers are sometimes insincere. I still chew my fingernails and the refrigerator isn't clean. Do you value your reasons for staying small more than the light shining through the open door? Do you value your reasons for staying small more than the light shining through the open door? Forgive yourself. Now is the only moment you have to be whole. Now is the sole moment that exists to live in the light of your true self. Perfection is not a prerequisite for anything but pain. Please, 
please, oh please, don't continue to believe in your disbelief. This is your day of awakening. The goal is so. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen.